Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from the Old Testament book of Ruth, the first chapter beginning with the first verse. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem of Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return to the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night, and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore return, refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clung to her, and she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods, Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me this day and more. Also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts upon the scripture be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. It has been said that a mother's work is never done. Well, that's certainly true for a woman by the name of Rosario Shilseth. You see, as a mother, Rosario has gone the extra mile for her daughter. I say that because her daughter is suffering from dementia. And are you ready for this? Her daughter is 87 years old. That's right, 87 years old, which means that Rosario, the mother, is 104. Isn't that amazing? A 104-year-old mother is taking care of her 87-year-old daughter. Yes, it's uh, true. A mother's work is never done. Of course, you don't have to be a mother to take care of someone. It happens all the time. Sometimes the person who needs you is a sister or a brother or an elderly mother or father or a friend. 
Sometimes the person comes to you because you're a good listener, or sometimes the person comes to you because you're someone who can help them out financially. Yes, it happens all the time. Now, if you're a good Christian, you're going to be there for the person who needs you, right? After all, a good Christian is caring and kind and compassionate. A good Christian is giving and generous, right? That's why you don't want to end up in the situation that a woman found herself in after her husband was diagnosed with a serious illness. Unfortunately, he had a blood disorder that left him feeling very weak and anemic. One day after an examination, the doctor asked to speak to the wife privately in his office. The doctor said, your husband is a very sick man, which is why I need you to be there for him. Every morning, you're going to need to get up early and fix him a nutritious breakfast. Now, he needs all the calories he can get, so don't be afraid to fix him things like pancakes, bacon, and eggs. Then do that with all of his other meals. You also might want to do some baking every day so there are lots of goodies around the house. And because your husband's immune system is weak, you're going to make sure that you keep the house absolutely spotless. You're going to have to dust and vacuum and change the sheets on the bed every day. And your husband has to be careful not to overexert himself. So you're going to have to do some of the things that he usually does, like take out the trash and mow the lawn and do the heavy lifting around the house. Do you understand, the doctor asked. The wife nodded her head and then went back to the waiting room. When her husband saw her, he asked anxiously, what did the doctor say? Oh, the wife said, the doctor says you're going to die. When you're a Christian, you're supposed to be there for those who need you. Before you do that, though, you better make sure you're wearing your oxygen mask. Now, I'm thinking, of course, about the oxygen mask that you find on airplanes. Before the plane takes off, the flight attendants always say the same thing. In the unlikely event that the cabin loses air pressure, oxygen masks will fall from the compartment above you. Do you remember what they always say next? That's right, they always tell you to put your oxygen mask on first before you try to help someone else. I thought about those words of wisdom as I pondered what happened to Naomi and her daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah. This is a story of a woman who refused to abandon her mother-in-law in her hour of need. But it's also a story about a woman who did. When Naomi tells her daughters-in-law to go back to their own families, Ruth refuses She refuses with a vow that has become famous over the years. Ruth says, do not entreat me from following you or to depart from you. For where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Where you lodge, there will I lodge. Where you die, I will die and there will I be buried. So Ruth goes with Naomi. Orpah, on the other hand, changes her mind and goes back to her family. Let's look at Orpah for a moment. Because the temptation is uh, to look down on Orpah and accuse her of being selfish, ungrateful. Is that really fair, though? Do we really know enough to say that about Orpah? Maybe... Orpah went back to her family because her own mother needed her. Or maybe Orpah wasn't physically or strong enough to make the journey. Or maybe Naomi played favorites and didn't really like Orpah. We just don't know. So for whatever the reason, Orpah made the decision that she couldn't help Naomi. She decided to put her oxygen mask on and go back to be with her family. 
Sometimes that's what you have to do. You have to take care of yourself before you can take care of someone else. After all, taking care of someone can be hard work. It can be physically, emotionally, and spiritually draining. Just look at Jesus. Jesus was a compassionate healer, right? But there were times when Jesus walked away from people who were begging him to heal them. Instead of healing them, Jesus walked away from them. He didn't do that often, but he did do it from time to time. And when he did it, he did it so that he could go off to be someplace by himself and pray, to take care of himself. That's what happens when you take care of yourself. Energy flows from you to another person. Do you remember what happened when that woman came up to Jesus in the crowd? She came up behind him and she touched the hem of his garment. As soon as she did that, Jesus turned around and said, Who touched my garment? And then he said that he felt the power go out of him. Jesus took care of himself because he knew that when you take care of someone, it can be emotionally, physically, spiritually draining. Power goes from you to the other person. So there were times when Jesus put himself first, times when Jesus took care of himself. That's what happened in that famous scene that took place in Bethany. You may remember that Mary comes up and she anoints Jesus with some costly perfume. When that happens, the disciples become indignant. They point out that the perfume could have been sold and the money used to help the poor. Jesus, though, tells the disciples to leave her alone. And then he says, you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus didn't care about the poor, What he was doing there is Jesus knew that the next day he was going to be arrested and then he was going to be crucified. So at that particular moment, Jesus needed Mary's deed of loving kindness. At that particular moment, Jesus needed to take care of himself. So in effect, he was putting on his oxygen mask. Like Ruth. You have been called to be there for others. But like Orpah, you've also been called to take care of yourself. Of course, this isn't an either-or proposition. It isn't a choice between taking care of others and taking care of yourself. It's really a both-and proposition. You take care of yourself so you can take care of others. And the more you take care of yourself, the more you'll be able to take care of others. Many years ago, there was a touching story that appeared in the Boston Globe about a man named Bob Conley. Bob Conley lives in Dorchester, and his life changed forever after his mother died. That's when he made the decision to move in with his three brothers, who were all mentally challenged. He did that by taking an early retirement from Gillette. So now he takes care of his brothers. He does the food shopping. He does the cooking. He even goes on family vacations with his brother to Disney World. He does encourage them to be as independent as possible, and they all have part-time jobs. Bob, however, is the one who is ultimately responsible for them. He makes their medical decisions, and he takes care of them, and he says he has no regret In the interview, he said, what is, is. You can either accept responsibility or you can run and hide somewhere. And I love these guys. When it comes to taking care of those who need you, the best thing you can do is take care of yourself. The best thing you can do is be like Orpah so that you can then be like Ruth. So the question this morning is really simple. Are you wearing your oxygen mask? And if you aren't, do you know where you can find it? Amen.